Welcome to the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show, where we dive deep into the hottest trends in health, beauty, and cosmetic treatments. I'm Dr. Anthony Yoon, America's Holistic Plastic Surgeon. Well, have you ever wanted to change the shape of your body? According to the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, you're not alone. Last year, over 1 million Americans underwent body contouring surgery, including tummy tucks, liposuction, lower body lifts, breast augmentations, and buttock enhancements. It's one of the fastest growing segments of cosmetic surgery, especially for men and women under 40 years old. The field and the procedures are getting so advanced that there is a burgeoning movement of plastic surgeons who specialize in just that, body contouring. There are right and wrong ways to perform these complex operations. So today, I have one of the country's foremost experts in body contouring to discuss this trend, as well as some of the innovative, state-of-the-art procedures he performs. So let's get started. My guest this week is a board-certified cosmetic plastic surgeon practicing in New York City. He attended Franklin and Marshall College, went to medical school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, and completed his general and plastic surgery training at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. He is now an associate professor of plastic surgery at Mount Sinai. My guest is certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery and a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. He is particularly known for his innovative and forward-thinking approach to plastic surgery. He has refined older and traditional procedures to meet the needs of current patients, creating his own procedures, such as the smooth tuck, refinements of the Brazilian butt lift, and a Botox-assisted breast augmentation. He has also been at the forefront of social media as an early adopter of social media platforms such as Instagram and Snapchat. His Snapchat account, NYC Plastic Surge, averages 3.5 million daily views and has been featured in U.S. News & World Report, The New York Post, People Magazine, The Doctors, and more as one of the most prominent and popular physicians on social media in the world. I'd like to welcome to the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show my friend and colleague, Dr. Matthew Schulman. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I mean, it really is my privilege to have you on. Um, and, you know, as I was telling you before we got started here, you know, I've started this show a couple months ago, and you've always been on my list of people to interview because I know you're doing a lot of state-of-the-art kind of cutting-edge procedures. Uh, also, you're huge on Snapchat, so I really want to, we'll get into that um, a little bit later. But the first thing I want to talk with you about is what led you to where you are in your practice now? So, uh, in the introduction, I mentioned that you graduated your general and plastic surgery residency at Mount Sinai, a uh, great program, uh, and now you're still in New York City. How did you decide to go about and establish the practice that you did? Well, when I finished my training, I always had an interest in cosmetic surgery, so mm -hmm. I decided this is what I want to do, so I just got to do it. So I stayed in New York, and I kind of just grinded and grinded and and what's evolved is is my practice today where I'm really 100% cosmetic surg surgery mm -hmm. and I focus mostly on the body. So mm -hmm. anything from the neck down is kind of my area. Mm -hmm. So it works well with my patients because I have a much younger demographic of patients. I have patients that are, you know, anywhere from, you know, 18 or 20 up to, you know, 35 to 40. So these are mm -hmm. people that are haven't quite gotten to the point where they're worried about their face yet aside from small you know, mm -hmm. Botox and fillers and things like that. So in New York City, I mean, it being one of the most competitive plastic surgery environments in the country, did you feel the need to have to kind of subspecialize in the body contouring that you did? Or is this something more that is just a love of yours that you said, hey, you know what, throughout my residency, throughout my training, I've always loved to contour and reshape the body? Well, part of the way I developed my practice is it started with what I'd like to, what I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. So and then I had that just sort of develop. So I never made a conscious effort of, you know, how to position myself in a competitive marketplace by doing things that other people aren't doing. Mm -hmm. You know, my philosophy was I'm going to do what I like to do. I'm going to do what I think I do well. Mm -hmm. And and if I do it the way I want to do it and people see that, 
I'll be successful. So mm -hmm. yes, New York City is extremely competitive. There's probably about 10 plastic surgeons just down the block from me. Yeah. But, you know, the good thing about New York is, is there's so many people. So you don't have that, you know, every, there's enough people to go around for yeah. every plastic surgeon. Yeah. And I mean, it's obviously a testament to your skill level, the fact that you've established a 100% cosmetic practice in New York City as a relatively younger surgeon. I mean, you're not a 60-year-old with white hair that's been going at this for 30 years. I have you a know. few grays, though. You can see that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're like me in that we're kind of the same generation. And, you know, I did the same thing when I started my practice. I said, look, you know, this is what I love to do. Um, there's a book written by uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, who uh, has written a lot of bestsellers. He's a general surgeon. And one of the things I found that was really interesting and helped really guide for me the way my practice went is uh, there are studies that show that the more you do of a certain surgery, the better your results are and the less your complications are. And so it definitely makes sense, even though the field of plastic surgery, as we both know, is incredibly broad in scope for us to subspecialize in those you know, 10, 15 procedures that we love the best and we know we do the best. Yeah, I mean, every, it makes complete sense. I mean, I, there, are, there are procedures that I just don't do. You know, I, for example, I don't do any rhinoplasties or nose jobs. Mm -hmm. So people call up and I just decided early on that I just don't enjoy it. It stresses yeah. me out. I just, yeah. and I can't do everything. And I had a fellow, you know, a chief resident once that told me, um, he's, you have to do what you do well. He's like, you don't go to Denny's for dinner. <laughs> you don't have to do everything. You just do what you, what you like to do and what you do well. Exactly. And that's it. And you can, you can have a successful practice and have happy patients and, you don't have to take everything that comes in the door. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's that's a great way to run your practice, and obviously it's done you well. So let's get started with some of these procedures. You know, one of the things I think that I admire, really, that I know I admire about you is that you tend to take procedures that are kind of tried and true. You know, doctors do this the same way over and over again, really, is some of these procedures for decades. Yet, as a you know, younger plastic surgeon who's involved with technology and, you know, you, you want to take these procedures and try to use technology to better them and make them as good as possible. And one of those I'm very interested to hear about is the Botox-assisted breast augmentation. So can you explain how this is different than a traditional breast augmentation and what patients can get as a benefit from using Botox? So this is, this is a really great one. And this is, this is something that as I was doing my training and I was doing breast reconstructions during residency and then subsequently doing breast augmentations as, you know, as a private practice um, plastic surgeon, something struck me as, you know, as you and I both know, the big issue when you put a breast implant under the muscle is the complications associated with the muscle. Mm -hmm. So you get muscle spasm. Mm -hmm. um, which leads to pain. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why people have pain afterwards or, or they feel that all that discomfort here. Or for example, um, people complain that the breast implants always sit too high. And, and, you know, as a plastic surgeon, you'll tell your patient, it's okay. They're going to, they're going to come down. It takes six months. They're, oh, they're supposed to look high. And I thought about that and I said, there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. So we know about Botox. Botox reduces, you know, the contracture, the action of any muscle we use in the face all the time. So I said, why am I not using this in the chest muscle? Mm -hmm. So what I do is while I'm doing a breast augmentation where the implant is under the muscle, I inject the muscle with Botox. And I use a very specific amount of Botox in very specific areas that I've sort of worked out in a laboratory, um, mm -hmm. in a cadaver lab. And what I've been able to do is allow that chest muscle to relax during the first four months of the healing period when you need it to be relaxed. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of benefits. The patients have much more, um, much more comfort. Mm -hmm. So they don't have that muscle spasm from the muscle contracting. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, they look better quicker. So mm -hmm. my patients get their quote unquote final result at a month as opposed wow. to waiting six months, nine months or a year because the muscle relaxes. So the hmm. implant drops into position much, much quicker. So that, it's, that it's does, become standard. It does make sense. I mean, when you think about it, one of the things that we find when we do breast augmentation surgery is, and especially when patients pick sizes that are quite large, is that that muscle up here really swells and you get this breast that literally feels like it starts at the collarbone and goes all the way down to their, you know, to the top of their abdomen. And so to relax that muscle and potentially decrease some of the swelling. And now, do you find that the implant settles more quickly that way as well? Absolutely. So that's why I, I'm seeing their final result in terms of implant position at one month. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I never did it personally in my practice, but maybe you did where, you know, you would give the patient systemic muscle relaxes or, or muscle relaxer pill mm -hmm. as part of their post-operative medicine. Yeah. And to me, it never made sense because, you know, patients always complain. Maybe it works, but it also makes them feel tired and sleepy and loopy and kind of out of it. So this is a way of giving muscle relaxation to the exact area of the muscle that you're trying to relax. It just, yeah. it just made total sense to me. Well, that's interesting. Have you found other surgeons doing the same thing or have you found surgeons actually backlash and saying, oh, you know, you're, you know, because I know you've, that you've done some news stories with this type of a thing. Has there been any backlash from the plastic surgery community poo-pooing it of, oh, you know, Botas doesn't belong there? Surprisingly, I think that the plastic surgeons that hear about this are actually pretty intrigued because oh, it good. makes total sense to people. Yeah. Now, it's easy for plastic surgeons to say, ah, that doesn't work. But I think this is one of those things that, that makes sense. I've had a lot of phone calls from, from surgeons because they want to know how much do you put in, yeah. where do you put it. So I'm obviously happy to share the information with them. Um, but, uh, but it's, I think the, the reception has been, has been really, you know, really, it's really well received for this specific yeah. procedure. Well, I think that's good. And it's a great idea. I mean, we're finding more and more uses for Botas, it seems like every week. And this is one that does definitely make sense. Uh, especially yeah. myself, I do 100, 150 breast augmentations a year. I have not used Botox, but definitely sounds like something that actually Maybe I'll try here in the near future. So I may give you a call and say, hey, exactly where do you put those things? Yeah, I'll give you the secrets. I'll tell you where to put it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go into the smooth tuck. Now, you know, I do a lot of tummy tucks as you do. What's the difference between a smooth tuck and a traditional tummy tuck that maybe most plastic surgeons perform? So a traditional tummy tuck really involves removing the excess skin and mm -hmm. tightening the abdominal muscles. That's what gives the the result that people want. So as you know, the ideal tummy tuck patient is the skinny mom who has hanging skin because it's a skin and muscle operation. Mm -hmm. What I found in my practice was, you know, most Americans are a little bit overweight. Mm -hmm. So they come into my office and they're not ideal candidates for a tummy tuck because they're still carrying a little bit of extra fat in the abdomen, specifically the upper abdomen. Mm -hmm. And when we do a tummy tuck, we can't, we have to be very careful with the liposuction that we do. So we exactly. concentrate the liposuction mostly on the sides, yep. but we avoid that upper abdomen area, which is where most people have the problem. Yeah. And so, I, I tell my patients that that's a danger zone. You know, we disrupt the blood supply so much around that area that if you liposuction, let's say, it, it makes sense for people to say, hey, why not liposuction the upper tummy and then pull it down? Isn't that going to make me the flattest possible? And the answer is theoretically yes but you're increasing the risk of healing problems. And as you and I both know, if a tummy tuck does not heal well because of blood supply problems, it can be an utter disaster. Right. So, so what's your solution to that with the smooth tuck? So, so what I've done is I've, I've developed a procedure where I'm doing primarily liposuction, mm -hmm. and then I'm combining with tummy tuck techniques where we're not disrupting the blood supply to the skin of the tummy tuck. So for example, in order to lift up the skin to get to the muscle to tighten it during a tummy tuck, you cut through all those blood vessels, which is exactly. why it's, it can be risky with liposuction. Mm -hmm. But with this procedure, I preserve all those blood vessels, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I'm able to remove the skin and move the belly button. So it's, it's almost like combining a procedure where we do all liposuction, then the patient comes back in a year and we do a tummy tuck but I combine it into one. Mm -hmm. So I find that there's two groups of people that this is really ideal for. One is the person that wants abdominal contouring, but is, but is a little bit overweight for a tummy tuck and they're not an ideal tummy tuck candidate because they would benefit more from aggressive liposuction than they would from mm -hmm. muscle repair because it's either or. Yeah, exactly. And the second group are the people that are ideal tummy tuck candidates. However, they want a faster recovery and they want to skip the muscle repair. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing the muscle repair, I substitute the liposuction. Okay. It's, you know, so procedures like this have been described. Um, this is something that you find kind of in the Brazilian literature where they mm -hmm. talk about a lipo abdominal plasty. Yep. Uh, when I, when I, when I came up with a smooth tuck about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. there wasn't that much in the literature about mm -hmm. it. Um, there are some key differences, but, um, but it's based on the premise that, if you're going to do aggressive liposuction, mm -hmm. you have to preserve the blood supply. Okay. So 
We do have before and after photos that we're going to show here. So if you are listening to this broadcast right now, let's say you're in your car or doing some work around the house, take a peek at the video uh, podcast as well. That's also on iTunes, same name. Uh, and you can see some of these amazing before and after photos of Dr. Schulman's uh, smooth tuck. So when you're doing the surgery then, you're combining the liposuction. You Obviously, if somebody has looseness on the inside, if they've got a diastasis, meaning the separation of the muscles, then they are automatically excluded then from getting a smooth tuck then. Is that correct? It, in theory, yes. However, what I need to do when I'm evaluating them is, is decide which would give them more improvement, mm -hmm. tightening the muscle or doing aggressive liposuction. Because even someone that has diastasis or separation of the muscle and can benefit from tightening, if you tighten the muscle and then you put that back down the skin and it's still a you know, a Hard thick layer of skin, yeah, exactly. you, you can't see what you did, so you don't yeah. get the improvement. So that's a patient who will get more improvement from the liposuction than they will from the muscle tightening. And what I do find after the liposuction in that area, that you do get some normal fibrosis and some tightening. Mm -hmm. So the 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 skin and the, the tissue beneath the skin will kind of hold the muscle together better, even though you're really not sewing the muscles together at all. Mm -hmm. So basically, for those of you who are kind of a novice to plastic surgery who are listening or watching today, liposuction can remove fat from the tummy. A tummy tuck can remove excess skin and the fat that basically is below it. But the problem is, is that if you kind of want both, it may not be safe to do both at one time if you combine that with a muscle tightening. And so by taking the muscle tightening out in those select patients, uh, this is a great way to kind of thin out the waist, thin out the, the abdomen, the upper abdomen, as well as get rid of that loose skin. And obviously, like I said, your results speak for themselves. So um, kudos to you. I, th I think it's a great idea. And uh, there are advantages, obviously, to that, especially in those people who are great candidates. And then, obviously, there are those who may need something a little bit different, in which case, obviously, you do something different for them. Um, now, one of the big things that you have made a name on is the Brazilian butt lift. And this is part of what I've seen on your Snapchat and is really popular uh, amongst the millennial crowd. Everybody wants kind of that J-Lo, Beyonce, Kim Kardashian behind. And you've been doing a lot more of this, I'm assuming, over the last five years, correct? Correct. I mean, I've probably been doing this, it's probably been about seven years now, but mm -hmm. definitely in the past five years, I'm seeing everything. Everything continues to go to go up in terms of the number of people requesting this procedure. So the Brazilian butt lift, could you explain to people who are watching and listening today, if they may not know what it is, can you explain exactly how that works and, and what do people get from it? Sure, so, so the Brazilian butt lift is a, a procedure that combines liposuction, which is fat removal, except we don't throw the fat out. We take that fat and we use it in areas where they need more fat or want more fat, such as the butt and the hips. So it's a, it's a way to combine two procedures where you're getting liposuction to harvest the fat, but also to contour the body and shape it. And then we're using that fat to, to either enlarge the butt because you just want it bigger or just reshape it because you want it rounder. So we can, you know, I have it, I have it both ways. I have people, people that come in that just want a reshaping procedure and want to look a little bit more youthful or look a little bit more fit. And then I have other people that come in that on my Snapchat, you may have heard that um, I use the term ABAP, as big as possible. Yeah. So people come in and they say, I want to be ABAP, as big as possible, and we can do that as well. Mm -hmm. So what would you consider, I mean, when we look at breast implants, we look at CCs in size. When you're injecting fat into the buttocks, we look at CCs as well. Um, what would you consider to be, and, and obviously every patient's a little bit different in size, but kind of a modest buttock enhancement, and then what is the most that in general that you would put in somebody per butt cheek, basically? Yeah, it's a little bit tricky because unlike a breast implant, the fat is not contained into one solid pocket. It's spread out. So mm -hmm. obviously a person that's six feet tall with wide hips will require more fat than someone who's five feet tall with narrow hips, exactly. and they may get the same general appearance. So now the one thing I will preface this is that I've been doing this a long time. I've done mm -hmm. probably five or 6,000 you know, Brazilian butt lift procedures. So my technique has evolved. I put in a lot of fat. So when I look at a person and I'm trying to judge in their mind, are they going to get a lot of fat or a little bit of fat? Mm -hmm. The number in my head is 1,000 cc's and that's okay. per side. Yeah. So I kind of will look at a patient, a potential patient and think, are they going to be over 1,000 cc's per side or under 1,000 cc's per side? Mm -hmm. So my average is about 11 or 1,200 per side, assuming wow. that they 
they have that donor fat, the, they have that fat that I can get, mm-hmm. that I can harvest in order to use, mm-hmm. and also assuming that they have the room to put the fat because you can't just keep stuffing in fat. Yeah, if exactly. you stuff in fat, the fat cells will compete with each other and more of them will die and you'll end up with, with only half the fat you put in anyway. Mm-hmm. What's the recovery time or the recovery like for those patients who are having the surgery? How do you have them take care of the area, that type of thing? So I, I'm very honest with my patients. I tell them that this is going to hurt. I tell my okay. patients, worst pain of your life for three or four days wow. and okay. really sore for a week and then some soreness for several weeks after. Mm-hmm. Most of my patients require, require about 10 days to two weeks off from work. Mm-hmm. Um, the other really tough part about this this procedure for people is is the no sitting restriction. Yeah. So you can't sit on the fat cells that I put in your butt. Um, and I tell my patients, no sitting on that fat for six weeks. And okay. it's important. And I use the analogy of, you know, putting grass seed down on the, you know, on the dirt. You put the grass seeds down, but if you walk on it, nothing's going to grow. And it's really the same thing. You need about six weeks for angiogenesis or the, the regrowth of blood cells into those fat cells so they become part of you and will stay there forever. And so the idea for those of you who are new to the idea of the Brazilian butt lift is it's taking fat from other parts of the body, purifying that fat, and then injecting it into the buttocks. But for that to stay, you need to have new blood vessels kind of grow into it to supply it. Otherwise, the fat will disappear, the body will reabsorb it, and, and sometimes it can even actually harden into little lumps and stuff. So that's kind of what you're saying is the idea is, is you want to put enough that people get the result they're looking for, but you can't just slam it in without using any specific techniques because the fat's not going to stay and you can get lumpiness and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, the, the issue people say, well, geez, I can't sit down for six weeks. The thought of that initially is horrifying of like, I have to lay down everywhere. I mean, <laughs> But interestingly enough, my experience has been, and I don't do anywhere near as many of these as you do, is that you can actually get around it by sitting, let's say, on the front of your thighs. Um, you don't have to necessarily be kneeling everywhere and that type of thing. Correct. So, I mean, so do you have I, little tricks that you tell them of, of how, how you can actually sit without technically sitting on it? Yeah. I mean, I tell my patients, um, sit upright with really good posture. And if you do that, if you know, everyone at home is probably sitting up right now. And if you sit upright on the edge of your chair, the weight's really on the back of your thighs. And that's how we normally sit. That's how our body is designed to sit. We don't sit on our butt. We sit on the back of our thighs. So if you do that, the, you're taking the pressure off your butt and you're fine. The worst thing you can do is sit in the comfy chair in the house and lean back and then you're right on your butt. Exactly. Or don't, you know, you can't sleep on your butt. That's mm-hmm. the worst thing you can do too. So People can get around it. There are several commercially available BBL pillows now Mm -hmm. where there are specially designed pillows that people can put under their thighs that helps take the pressure off of their butt. And I think that's really helpful to people. So, you know, my patients, like you said, they're shocked at first when they, when they hear about that, Six weeks, but they all, they all do fine. And interesting thing I find is that come six weeks when I say, congratulations, you can sit probably 80% of people say, no, I'm going to wait a little bit longer because yeah. they're so, at that point, they're just nervous and they just don't want to ruin their result. So now what do you think about buttock implants? Do you put those in as well or do you really just stick with the fat grafting? I personally don't, don't place implants. Okay. Um, there are a lot of people that do and I think that for, in the right person, it's their only option. You know, if yeah. people come to me all the time and they're just too skinny because what people have to understand is in order to be a candidate for a Brazilian butt lift, you have to have fat to donate. So if you have no fat on your body and your butt is flat, there's nothing that I can do for you. Um, gaining weight, we can talk about um, if you if you want to, but I don't think that's a good option because that's not a yeah. good long-term people, solution. People don't want to, and then they lose weight and the fat disappears too, so exactly. I would agree with you. But um, implants, implants definitely have some complications. Yeah. Um, so I think that if, if someone's going to do it, do you know, look into implants, they really need to find someone that does a lot of it. Yeah, um, I, I think that really the way to do it is a co- probably a combination of implants plus some fat transfer. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think the the reason I like the Brazilian butt lift technique, which we touched on a little bit, is you get two procedures in one. So you're getting the benefit of the liposuction. Mm-hmm. So you're getting the contouring. So I'm able to get your waist smaller and your hips smaller and just reshape you. And then we're putting the fat in. Mm-hmm. If we're just using an implant, all we're doing is taking your same body shape 
and just making your butt a little bit bigger, which I don't think has the same effect. Yeah, and I would agree if if anybody has the option of choosing between, okay, do I do a buttock implant or do I do the Brazilian butt lift, the fat grafting, then no question the fat grafting is a better option. You know, that area of the body is not technically clean, and so you're putting an, a foreign body into it that could potentially get infected. You know, you're going to have a higher risk. However, if you're using your own fat, that's a whole other story. You know, your body can uh, absorb some of that that obviously doesn't stay, but you develop new blood supply to it and, and much less risk of getting that infected. So I'm like you. I mean, I do the Brazilian butt lift, but I don't put it in buttock implants either. And the other thing to keep in mind is the fat that I put in your butt will change with you. So if you yeah. gain weight or lose weight in the future, it's going to change with you as opposed to an implant, which won't change. So when you're, it's really no different than a breast implant. You know, if you have an implant in place and you age 10 years or 15 years, things can look a little bit funny. Yeah, with the, with the buttock implants too, I always think of the George Costanza. Now you're a New York guy, so I'm sure you're a Seinfeld fan. And I think of George Costanza with that massive wallet and thinking of sitting on one of those in each butt cheek just, and, and that's kind of how I explain to some of my patients is that you got to think, I mean, you're going to be sitting on this thing that's thick, that's, uh, that's, that feels firmer than your surrounding tissues. Man, if, you're, if you want your buttocks to be larger, then definitely try to do the Brazilian butt lift first if you're a candidate. Otherwise, you, know, you can consider the buttock implants, but it's not something that I typically recommend to patients. So I agree. Um, well, we've got some before and after photos that we're going to show here uh, on the video. So if you're listening, uh, take a peek at our video. She's got some really impressive before and afters. You can take a look at the Brazilian butt lift, how the buttocks are much larger afterwards, but take a peek at the shape, because that's the big thing. Like anybody can, any plastic surgeon can suck fat out and, and you know, inject it into the buttocks, but um, what you're gonna see with Dr. Schulman's results here is more than just that. You can see the shaping of the other parts of the body and how the buttocks are shaped in a certain way that makes it more pleasing. I mean, if you inject fat into the wrong part of the buttocks, is Dr. Schulman knows, you can actually make the buttocks look worse. There really are certain parts of the buttock that you have to inject it into and other parts that you kind of stay away from to get the optimal results. And you'll see that in these photographs. Well, let's proceed on to probably one of the most popular operations in my practice, and I'm sure in yours, is the mommy makeover. Now, people have heard that term, but if people haven't heard that and don't know what it is, can you explain what a mommy makeover is? Sure, so a mommy makeover is just a term that we use to, to describe a single operation in which we do multiple things to reverse the effects of pregnancy um, or, or aging on your body. So most commonly it may involve a tummy contouring, an abdominal contouring procedure like a tummy tuck or liposuction, maybe a breast procedure like an implant or a lift or a combination of an implant plus lift, um, or you know, commonly now is including a Brazilian butt lift. So it's a general term and I tell my patients you know, because we get calls all the time saying, you know, um, you know, what's the recovery from a mommy makeover? How much is a mommy makeover? And I say, there are no two mommy makeovers that are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's just a term for doing a lot of things in one safe single operation. Yeah, I agree. And so I do a lot of those. We have some before and after photos here um, of Dr. Schulman's mommy makeovers. You'll see some really nice uh, improvements with the smooth tuck um, and really just the shaping. I mean, it really is popular nowadays to try to combine these into one. Are there any patients that you'll say, you know, we'll do a mommy makeover, but maybe let's not do it all at one time. Maybe let's split them up. Yeah. I mean, we obviously have to judge each person individually. Obviously my patients for mommy makeovers need to be, um, in optimum medical health. Mm -hmm. So they need to have no medical issues and they need to understand that when you combine two or three surgeries into one, sometimes the recovery is tougher than, yeah each surgery individually. So it, they have to understand that. The, the other thing that, that I think we have to be careful about is I often recommend splitting up a Brazilian butt lift with a tummy tuck. Yeah. Because if you think about it, when you're healing from the tummy tuck, you have to lay on your butt. And yeah. we just talked about all the disadvantages of laying on your butt. So there are some situations where I will do it, um, specifically if the person needs more of the fat in their hips. Mm -hmm. um, and not really in the back of their butt where they may damage it. So there are some situations where, where either medically it doesn't make sense to combine because it's too much surgery for that person, mm -hmm. or you know, from what we understand about surgery, there's certain procedures that don't go well together from a healing standpoint. Yeah, and I totally agree. My patients that 
want a tummy tuck with the Brazilian butt lift, I do the same thing. I say, look, the, the recovery from a tummy tuck, the first week, if, if you're tightening up the muscle, now your smooth tuck's a different story. I'm assuming that recovery is going to be much easier. But, you know, I tell my patients that 70% of the pain and discomfort of the recovery of a tummy tuck is when we tighten those inner muscles together. We, we fix that diastasis, that separation of that muscle. And because of that, you're going to be bent over for about a week before we can get you standing up straight. And if you're going through that and you can't sit down on your buttocks or you have to sit down a certain way, that is just going to be no fun. And you are not going to like me for quite a while. So I do the same I've thing. De I've definitely found that there have been some advances in terms of anesthesia and pain medicine. That So I, f I think we're all doing more combined procedures now than we did even five years ago, because I think the safety is much better. Mm -hmm. um, but also one thing, and you know, I don't know if you're using this in your practice, but the the development of Expiril, mm -hmm. which is a long-acting pain medicine, which is an injection, has really changed a lot of my practice. So a lot of this, you know, you know, for those of you listening, Expiril is a long-acting numbing medicine that's injected at the time of surgery and can last for four or five days. And what I find is that during the tummy tucks, when you're you're putting stitches in that muscle and tightening the muscle. If I'm injecting that whole area with this medicine at the time of surgery, it's completely different than it was just a few years ago, and it makes a recovery so much easier. Yeah, and you know, I tried to get expert. I work mostly out of a hospital, um, and I tried Difficult. to get them to pick it up, and it's so expensive they won't. So I do. We do pain pumps, which is essentially the yeah. same thing, but. Um, with a pain pump, you got to carry this big thing around filled with medication. With Expro, what you're using, you don't have to carry anything around. It's just injected into you. So I'm hoping, right. I'm fingers crossed that the hospital I work out of actually allows us to bring it in. I, I'd bring it in myself if they would allow me to do that, just because my understanding is that it does help patients so much. Um, well, one of the things that you have done that I think um, really plastic surgeons need to be aware of this, and I do think that we need to recognize you for it, is that you spend a lot of time educating patients on Snapchat. You know, you are one of the most followed plastic surgeons, if not physicians, in the country on Snapchat. You have over 3.5 million people view your videos every day, which is more than most te national television shows. Uh, and I've seen your Snapchat many times one thing that I like about it is that you are very educational. I mean, you are there teaching how the surgery works, recovery from it. How did you get into Snapchat? And when did you start thinking about snapping uh, your surgeries and, and, and the educational content that you're providing? So I got, I got involved with social media early on. Like, um, and like most people, I went through the evolution. So I first started with Facebook, then I went to Twitter, and then I went to Instagram. But I was looking for a way to show my surgeries live. And at the time, I played around with something called Periscope, which you may or may not be familiar yeah. with. And I just found that, I just found it just didn't, for a variety of reasons, didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So Snapchat at the time was still just a way for, you know, teenagers to send naked pictures to their friends. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And then they, they developed this, this ability to show stories. And that, that was sort of the aha moment where I was like, this may work. Mm -hmm. And I started playing around with it. And, and for full disclosure, I'm not the only plastic surgeon doing it. And I was not the first plastic surgeon to do it. Mm -hmm. But what I, what, I, what I did, which I think was different, is I really wanted to focus my Snapchat on the education. Yeah. And I wanted to bring people into my operating room um, because the stuff that I was seeing on Snapchat that you kind of see now is, you know, everyone has their own style. But yeah. I didn't want it to be about the extracurriculars. I didn't want it to be about the staff and kind of the other, I want it to be about the surgery and the medicine and the patients and the education. So mm -hmm. I bring people into my, into my operating room. I explain the procedures, we show everything. Um, and it's really been, it's really been well received. And, and the most amazing thing to me is, you know, I have a lot of students that follow me, which I think is amazing. I have high yeah. school students, college students, medical students, and they really, you know, the feedback I get from them is that they really appreciate the the teaching and the educational aspect of it mm -hmm. um, to the point where I've actually just recently started a um, student observership program mm -hmm. where I'm allowing students who are following me on Snapchat and we're, you know, we're starting next week. So we have, oh, we have cool. dozens and dozens of people lined up already to come in and observe. And because this is, you know, it's just me in my office, it's not an official anything. Mm -hmm. I can, we can do it any way we want. We don't have the, 
yeah. you know, the, the restrictions of doing it in a hospital or a medical student, it's a medical school. It's just people coming in to hang out and seeing what, what I do. Yeah. And, and like I said, I viewed your Snapchat many times and, and I really commend you on what you're doing because just like you said, is it's providing education. And, and we've all gone through the medical process where we've had doctors who've helped us and who've trained us and they haven't been necessarily paid for it. It's just the fact that it's kind of, you know, you, you pass it along, you, pa you, you pay it forward to others. And so I want to commend you for doing that. But even so, as you and I know, there are some plastic surgeons who are a bit up in arms about doctors who are, you know, performing operations on Snapchat. Are you, um, and you're showing, let's say, some of your before and afters right on the operating room table. And is, is this cheapening our profession or is this even something that is unethical? Uh, what do you feel about that? I know I've seen some of your quotes in some of our um, kind of trade magazines and our um, journals and things like that. And I know you're obviously a big proponent of it, but what are your thoughts on those people who are kind of pushing back and saying, maybe we shouldn't do this? Well, I mean, the, the first thing, obviously, to, to, to put out there is that every single patient that appears on my Snapchat signs an extensive written consent giving permission to do it. Mm -hmm. So nothing's done without their knowledge or permission. Um, but there's going to be critics with anything, and I think that some of the criticism is legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, however, you can't just put that criticism on everybody using Snapchat. You mm -hmm. know, there's – you can't just – you can't criticize the social media platform for mm – -hmm actions of a few. So I think that there are situations where some physicians go too far and they push the boundaries of good taste or professionalism. A hundred percent. I agree with them completely. Um, but there's, there are people who are doing this responsibly and respectfully and, and within the guidelines set forth by the, you know, the, the American society of plastic surgeons. So I think that there's, I think that with anything, there's, there's the potential for um, things to be used in a way that 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 people will criticize. So, yeah. you know, what I say to the critics is, I say you're you're 100 percent right in certain situations. You know, don't don't group us all together. And 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 I always invite people watch my Snapchat. And if someone has a specific criticism about the way I'm doing it, I am 100 percent all ears. But yeah. most people, once they view my Snapchat, they're like, oh, okay, well, you know. <sighs> That's okay the way you're doing yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as physicians, we're we've always been a little bit resistant to change as a group. Um, and that as as a, you know, I mean, you're a board certified valid plastic surgeon. You you've done all your training, you've passed your boards, you're a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons like I am. And we tend to as a group be resistant to change whereas maybe some doctors who aren't plastic surgeons but want to do what we do aren't. And so they're trying to take, use these types of things, use Snapchat, use Instagram to their advantage to say, hey, look, look at my results. And I'm not even a real plastic surgeon, but look, I can do this. And so mm -hmm. I think it is up to people like yourself, like myself, and some of the younger plastic surgeons in, in, in our field to take the ball and say, hey, look, you know what, some of the older guys, you know, may not like this, but we're here to advance our specialty. We're here to say, hey, look, we're real board certified plastic surgeons. We've done everything the right way. Let's try to open this up because for you, I mean, you know, you get 3.5 million people watch your Snapchat every day. You're not going to operate on all these people. You know, if people watch your videos and they say, wow, I kind of like how he does this, op this operation and I love that result. I'm going to go call my local plastic surgeon and have and see if I can get in for a consultation. You know, you kind of benefit everybody. So hey, yeah, I'm with I mean, you. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right because my Snapchats, it's not an infomercial. It's not. Yeah. Look, look how good I am. Call me. Let me operate on you. It's really, it's really giving information without soliciting business. So people are becoming educated. And I think it's something that all plastic surgeons can benefit from by, by educating and destigmatizing. Yeah. And what, what I find ironic is the same surgeons who, who were criticizing me a year ago mm -hmm. are now calling me <laughs> up and saying, you know, can you help me? How do I do this? Yeah. So I think people are. I think I think you're seeing a change within the past few months that people are really coming around and and now you know I I'm been, I've been working with the American Society of Plastic Surgeons to help develop guidelines for social media use so that we have some guidelines and I will be speaking to the the Plastic Surgery Society at the national meeting so now I'm being invited to speak about you know how to implement Snapchat responsibly into the practice so 
you know, now I'm going to all sorts of regional and national meetings. So I, I think that, I think the change is coming. Yeah. Well, one thing I'd like to do at the end of every program is ask, is ask my guest, if you can give one piece of advice to the people who are watching today, uh, Dr. Matthew Shulman, board certified plastic surgeon in New York City, what piece of advice would that be for them to basically help make their lives better, more fulfilled? Well, you know, I, obviously I'm in the, I'm in the business of vanity. However, I think that people need to be comfortable with the way they appear um, and need to be comfortable on the inside. So obviously, you know, we change the way people look, but we also change the way people feel. So I think that's important that, that people really look inward and are comfortable with the way they are, you know, deep inside. And if that means that they want to make a change on the outside, great, so be it. There's, there's great plastic surgeons and well-trained plastic surgeons that can help them. But I think, I think the key is really how they feel deep down because you and I have both operated on people yeah. where they look amazing afterwards and you give them exactly what they want, but they're still not happy because they're not happy within themselves. So exactly. it sounds a little cliche, but I think it's, I think it's really true that the person has to be happy with what they look like inside and then look at changing the outward appearance. I totally agree with you. I mean, in the end, it comes down to being, you know, be, you're not going to find happiness through plastic surgery. Can you improve the quality of your life? Definitely. But it's, you know, happiness really obviously comes from within and from other things. So his name is Dr. Matthew Shulman. He is a board certified plastic surgeon in New York City. Uh, highly recommend. Check out his Snapchat. It's NYC Plastic Surge. That's NYC Plastic Surge. He's also on Instagram at NYC Plastic Surge as well. And check out his website. It's drshulmanplasticsurgery.com. That's Dr. S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N plasticsurgery.com. We'll also have links to it um, if you uh, go to the web page for this as well. And, and like I said, there's a lot of before and after foes. If you're listening on the show, check out the video podcast. This one's a not miss, can't miss it, because you really want to see the amazing results that Dr. Schulman can get um, with his state-of-the-art body contouring procedures. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to have you on. Yeah, great. It was really nice uh, being on with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Dr. Anthony Yoon, America's Holistic Plastic Surgeon. This is the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. We'll see you next week. Do you want to look 10 years younger without having surgery? Well, my best-selling book, The Age Fix, will tell you how. I spent the past 17 years learning the secrets to turning back the clock and have written all the best of these secrets in this book. This includes the Age Fix Diet, simple changes to what you eat that can make a huge difference in your appearance. I'll share with you a simple skincare routine to keep aging and wrinkles at bay. And I'll share with you the best secrets to treat every single beauty and aging problem there is. From age spots to wrinkles, saggy skin to bad breath, saddlebags to hair loss. And almost all of these can be effectively treated without surgery. So are you ready to turn back the clock and kick Father Time's backside? If so, check out The Age Fix. Now, if you purchase it on my website, dryoon.com, you'll get over $10 off the cover price, free shipping, and you'll receive several free gifts, including a bonus chapter that you can only get by purchasing the book there. Thank you for making The Age Fix such a huge success.